Next up in our exciting lineup is Jeff Perry, who plays Cyrus Bean on ABC Scandal. Mr. Perry has a long history with the city of Chicago. Born in Highland Park, he and his high school friends co-founded the Steppenwolf Theater Company, which is now a Tony Award winning theater company. He has since then moved to Los Angeles where he began his, the where he began his career in film and television, and he has been since in Grey's Anatomy, Prison Break, and most recently Scandal. Scandal is one of television's highest rated dramas starring Kerry Washington as Olivia Pope, a former White House communications director turned crisis manager that represents Washington's elite. However, her close ties with the president and Cyrus, chief of staff to the president, keeps involving her and her team in the affairs of the White House. Cyrus Bean is ruthless, manipulative, and a self-identified political monster. Although he rigged an election, has an assassin on speed dial, and is complicit in multiple murders, he remains one of Scandal's most revered characters. Even while acting monstrously, Cyrus is a true believer in the promise and opportunities of America and in the virtue and potential of the president. This week's episode definitely cemented him as the most complex and perplexing character of the show. Joining Mr. Perry is Maureen Ryan, a television critic for the Huffington Post who previously worked at the Chicago Tribune. Variety Magazine named her as one of the six most influential critics in America. So now, join me in welcoming Jeff Perry and Mo Ryan as they continue the discussion on Washington-based political dramas. Thank you. We're going. Oh! Hey, guys. How's it going? Hey, guys. Hey, what's up? Hello. Hello, hello. Okay. So we thought we'd spend the first portion of this where you could just tell us everything that happens in the season finale of Scandal, <laughs> right? Excellent. Yeah. Who wants to live the rest of their college career in the basement of B613? <laughs> because then, I, then we can talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, what can I even possibly tease? We know, if we watched a couple nights ago, that Cyrus didn't do what Jake told him to do. He hung up that phone um, and sauntered down the hall. Oh, la, 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 haven't seen the show. La, 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 it's on the DVR. La, 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 la. Okay, okay. So don't talk about two nights ago. <laughs> in very Put general your fingers terms. in your ears if you didn't see two nights ago. Okay, anyway. We know, we know where it was. Uh, we've gone from. The second to last episode took us from six days out on the election to three days out. Um, the final episode, we're three days out through the afternoon, early evening of Tuesday, election day. And we may well find out who wins. And it's not looking good for Fitz. And... That's all I can tell you and still keep my job. <laughs> well, you know, just in general terms, when you started this job, you've been a working actor now for 40 years. Did you ever think it would rise to this level in the popular culture that Scandal would take off like it has? Hmm. Shonda is unique, I think a really unique writer in the television world. And I wouldn't even qualify it there. I'd just say a really unique dramatist. I think she's an amazingly populist writer. Mm -hmm. She has the Paige Turner oomph of the trashiest summer beach novel <laughs> that you'd ever want. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think she writes really groundable, authentic relationships. The James Cyrus relationship. I'm a big fan of. I'm a big fan of relationship writing. I found, uh, for instance, Connie Britton and Kyle Chandler's husband and wife relationship in in Friday Night Lights just ridiculously gorgeous, real, and and deep. And I yeah. Um, and I th and I thought the same was true of the James Cyrus writing. Um, mm -hmm. It was, it's been such, such a joy to play. So, um, 
And as I say, an ensemble writer, I grew up making goddess and god of everything where collaboration felt like it helped create story. Gary Sinise and John Malkovich and Laurie Metcalf and I, and members uh, uh, first and second generation of Steppenwolf Theater. We were, um, we were drawn for whatever mysterious reasons to collaborations. It could have been Woody Allen and Diane Keaton. It could have been the first few generations of Saturday Night Live. It could have been Second City TV. It could have been Lucy and Ricky, for God's sakes, from I Love Lucy. It could be uh, Monty Python. It could be Scorsese and De Niro. It could be uh, uh, Robert Altman's uh, um, repeated use of artists. But we were, uh, we were tremendously compelled by those examples of storytelling where uh, chemistry and some co-joining of souls was telling the story. That's sort of the fabric of the relationship, arguably, between Woody Allen and Diane Keaton had to be there for Annie Hall to be a masterpiece, you know? Um, same is true of De Niro and Scorsese work, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we were drawn like crazy to that. I never thought, you guys, that I would feel the level of satisfaction and challenge and ensemble loving chops again that I have felt these last few years under Shonda's um, uh, uh, guidance. It's been actor heaven. People ask me how I'm feeling. I've answered 17 questions, haven't I? Why don't I stop at the Keep one? Keep going. Anyway, Keep going. Anyway, I don't know, you guys. Like, you know, cousins, old friends who maybe I haven't talked to in a couple years. How, how, how you doing, Jeff? This must feel good. Because I, um, and I say, my cheeks hurt <laughs> because I've been grinning so hard, you know, for the two and a half years or so of the show. I think that would also describe Cyrus's personality, right? Always a mm -hmm. smile. Mm -hmm. Or would you do you think that James brought out the best of this man? Completely. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Shonda created an exquisite, horrible chemistry <laughs> where I'm going to be partly responsible for his. Anybody not watch the last 17 <laughs> episodes? Um, um, for the end of our relationship and. Uh, um, and he, James, was the first and only love of his life so far. He was in a lie of a relationship to a woman before. And, uh, and James taught him to begin to unashamedly say, this is me. I'm gay. This is who I am. Um, we find all that out in just a few episodes ago. The first meeting, the first kiss. Cyrus coming out of the closet publicly in Washington, D.C., you know. Um, so, yeah, James, uh, uh, I'm still mourning it <laughs> a little bit. I am. Dan, who, is, who plays it, is a good buddy. We've known each other for 15 years. And uh, um, actors in the audience would, uh, you know, completely empathize. It's been like, oh, oh, to get to do this together in kind of a partnership has been amazing. And when we found out, you know, that plot needed someone to exit, um, uh, it, it was a real mourning period, personally. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, though, that obviously Scandal is very stylized and very heightened. It's very melodramatic at times. But I think, as you said, that the relationships ground it. But I do think that it is kind of making an in interesting commentary about the public and the private face, and that's really played out in, your, in every character, I think. But, but so who Cyrus was privately in his intimate personal life and who he was in, in the field sort of politically, um, Scandal is often about that dichotomy between the two worlds, what's public mm -hmm. and what's private. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. is that something that you think the show is actually making you know, an intelligent commentary on that? Is that something you ever think about with 
with how, how that world works? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Mo. I mean, so th there's something fundamental to Shonda. When Shonda jumped into this genre of DC politics, of political thriller, uh, it, that just kind of emerged. Mm -hmm. uh, we obviously so strong at relationship writing. Yeah. S um, so, so, so gifted with dialogue. But then this, um, <coughs> but then the, the, the halls of power that are very Greek, very Roman, very Shakespearean, you know, um, very time-honored territory for, for, for writers, she's taken to in an amazing way. Yeah. And so that, uh, you know, for want of a better comparison, just feels really Shakespearean to me, um, which, which, which has an absolutely natural obsession with uh, where, where private and public meet. Yeah. And one of the things I think a lot of these shows that have been talked about today really get into in a comedic way, in a dark way, in, in this scandal way, which I don't think there's a word for what that is. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I don't even mind telenovela, yeah. and, you know, sometimes as a comparison, because it, it sort of consciously gives itself all of the juiciest liberties right. that the cheesiest soap opera ever gave itself, you know? And um, uh, and then tries to do something else as well, exactly. a, a sort of grounded at the same time. Exactly. Which I just I love the attempt, and I you know, and I feel like it it in writing terms anyway, uh, it does it really pulls it off. Yeah. In it in it scandal House of Cards Veep you could almost make the argument all these shows Alphas even like all the shows that we're talking about in this realm and even the West Wing, having this much power, it's almost toxic to an individual and it certainly seems toxic to relationships. Would you say that that's kind of a, a theme that yeah, comes out? Yeah, this is a, I don't know if this is a jaded vision, cynical, absolutely realistic, not as bad as it really is. I, 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 I don't know. But it is dark because, I mean, how she gets us to forget that Fitz strangled this old woman. You know, <laughs> uh, um, I'm not sure. That, that, that is a little conjuring trick of Shonda and writers that is quite amazing to me. Um, uh, you know, but it is dark, man. Yeah. And, and it is a, uh, uh, yeah, it is a, it is a dark commentary. Uh, it, I don't, like I say, I don't know how realistic it is. Have you ever had feedback from people who work in DC? Kind of sweet or joking feedback. Uh, Barack Obama at a, uh, told Shonda Rhimes at a Kennedy Center Honors where she was a few feet away. Um, Shonda, I wish it was half as exciting. In the real <laughs> uh, um, and Bill Clinton uh, um, uh, across the aisle of a flight with Kerry Washington, you know, said, Ms. Washington, you've got to tell me what happens next. <laughs> I, you know, uh, um, uh, so, you know, those are the little anecdotes I've heard. But I have, yeah, I'm, I'm getting to go to the White House Correspondents' Dinner for the first only time in my life, and in days, you know, May 2nd or something like that. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick some brains and go, okay, what's your... Uh, journalists are asking me. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, what, what's close to real? What's completely off? Is the spirit of this sometimes in reality? You know? Um, the word monster. <laughs> I mean, when, you, when, when you talk about Cyrus, that has to come up, right? Um, my question for you is, is someone who built this character and, and plays him. Cyrus the Virus. Cyrus the it, Virus. I'm seeing on a lot of tweets. Nice. So, yeah. um, do you think he was always a monster? And this just refined and distilled that? Or was, did he turn into one over time through this process of being in politics? I think some monster was kind of there. When he came out as a bawling baby. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
I think. Yeah. Yeah. And but do you think that getting this close to the actual seat of power um, does it corrupt? Does it corrupt? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think Shonda is. That's undeniable, you know, Mo. Right? There is a progression. Um, from first episode through forty something episodes now, um, in in Shonda's vision, of if you think you had a white hat, good luck <coughs> keeping it spotless. You know, good luck holding on to it. Good luck relinquishing it and getting it back on. <laughs> yeah, um, and and part of Shonda will root for that process of. Can I be compromised? Can, can my soul be tested? Can I sort of come through it? Can I be reclaimed? Mm -hmm. Can I be redeemed? Mm -hmm. are, are themes that are, because now with a little bit of more maturity, you know, and duration with a series, are, are, are starting to come up. So that's interesting, yeah. We were talking a little bit backstage and you said something that kind of melted my brain. You said that the first couple of episodes, you thought, Cyrus is kind of the Sam Waterston character here. He's the, he's so the funny. moral I did. Center. I thought, wait, I'm the moral guide here. I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the moral compass. I love this guy. Um, and, uh, you know, this was the era early on when I'm sitting in a hallway and going, Alexander Hamilton, as great a leader as this nation ever had, he, but he, he wasn't the president. He knew who the president should be. He knew who the country needed when it needed it. Um, and I go on to say something to live like, I believe that Fitz could do those normal things. He could mow the grass. He could raise kids. He could walk his dog. A simple life, a happy life. Mm -hmm. But Olivia, some men aren't meant to be happy. They're meant to be great. And it was in that era, very early on, uh, when I um, innocently, hopefully thought, I think I'm the, I think I'm the Abe Lincoln <laughs> of this television show. <laughs> you <know>? And <laughs> Shonda quickly set me straight with just a few more episodes. Yeah. Um, but it, to, to, to sort of play defense for Cyrus, doesn't don't politicians who get to the level that fits or any anyone in a great deal of power, whether you're a studio head, whether you're a president, whether you're a CEO, you need a Cyrus, don't you think? I mean, those people have a Cyrus working for them, usually breaking kneecaps and getting things done. Chicagoans. <laughs> I got I got this job courtesy of a really succinct, beautiful acting note from, I believe, it came, well, it came from Paul Lee's office, and Paul is one of the co-heads of uh, drama at ABC. And Shonda and I had, and had worked on one little scene, sent it up, sent the tape upstairs, and they said, eh, it's okay, it's okay, but you know what? Less lovely professor, please, and more Rahm Emanuel. <laughs> and I knew a bit about Ram, and I read a little bit more. And there was one image that really stuck in my head. It might have been a New York Times piece, you guys. At the end of uh, a victorious Bill Clinton election, and Ram is working for Mr. Clinton, former President Clinton, and Ram and a colleague are going over a list of Democrats, those who have been loyal and those who they consider disloyal to the election effort. And whenever he heard a disloyal name, he was holding a fork. And he'd hear a name, and he'd nod, fine, fine, fine. He'd hear another name, and he'd go, dead. <laughs> more, 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 dead. <laughs> so um, I thought, I thought, uh, oh, excellent, good note. <laughs> OK, I've just got to remember a fork in my fist and saying dead. And, uh, and we sent a different tape up, uh, and, it, and it worked, I guess. Do you think um, Cyrus? Or so people, yeah, I think in real politics do need such people. Yeah. 
But do you think at the core he does or had real values aside from getting Fitz elected and then reelected? I think he still does. Really? I, if, if, if Cyrus was not motivated by the belief that Fitz can still actually be one of our great presidents uh, uh, in the country's history, I wouldn't know how to play him. Really? Because he has to have something Not motivated core. by just a stratego game. Right. Um, that, that I don't know how to relate to that personally. If there isn't true idealism and some love in the guy, I don't think he's worth playing. Then what are those ideals? I don't ideals? think it's believable. What are those ideals? What are those, those, those ideas in the back of his head that he thinks Fitz can execute or that he believes, that Cyrus believes? I think he believes it fits on a whole array of policy issues mm -hmm. of making us that actually are tremendously similar, whether reached, half reached, or dismally failed at by the Obama administrations, are very, actually very democratic, mm -hmm. or at least traditionally democratic and liberal, are shrink this world and figure out how we can increase a sense of dependency and codependency mm -hmm. and empathy and love instead of um, defining our existence by our differences. Right. Um, and you, you know, when you think of the environment, when you think of foreign policy, when you think of uh, military policy, when you think of, you know, when you think of anything, it can, it, you can put it under that um, banner mm -hmm. of this planet is getting tinier and tinier and more and more endangered. And how do we solve those things together? Right. Not how do we define ourselves by our boundaries right. and our borders and our differences. Yeah. You know, I think... Um, and I think Cyrus believes Fitz can do, can make headway there, real headway, right. lasting headway. Um, unfortunately, all we've done is make a mess of things and get in our own way. Yeah. I, I wouldn't exactly make the argument that Fitz has had a stellar record so far. No, no, no I know. I think no. I think um, Fitz has been really good at having an affair. Uh, well, you know. Yeah. So B three sixteen. I find it very interesting that as all these controversies have swirled about the NSA spying on Americans, all these agencies that are um, doing things we didn't know about or doing them to the extent that we didn't know about. Um, I think Scandal is actually making an interesting point about uh, the nature of power, and sometimes that power lives in the shadows, and it's some, sometimes things we read about in the paper every day. I mean, is, is that something that, are you a political buff on that level? Do you think about the parallels to the NSA and things like that in terms of how the show operates, or is it just a telenovela <laughs> in your mind? No. I. You know, our audience may have much more um, sophisticated ruminations about this. Uh, I've never been anything but willing to believe in a uh, gigantic subterfuge of all that all governments engage mm -hmm. in, um, that covert. Um, activity <sighs> goes back to cave men and women, I assume, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, so, so uh, uh, I don't think this far-fetched right. particularly at all. Right. We know how many people are, we now know of so many instances of our government silently assassinating. Um, civilians and other leaders. Um, so this, there's nothing far-fetched really here. Um, uh, yeah, so, so I think she is very purposefully commenting on that. And as like a good dramatist, I think she's given both sides. Right. You know, she's, Sean is always, and the writers are always looking to give um, both multiple sides of an issue uh, that 
covert operations are absolutely necessary for the functioning of a government is one point of view, that uncovering them is criminal is, <laughs> is an attendant point of view, um, that uh, one, <laughs> one covert <laughs> Uh, agency saying to another, you have no business, this is not your realm, um, is borne out by all sorts of stories mm -hmm. that have come to light in the last couple of decades. You mean this horrible crap happened because the CIA and the FBA were fighting and it was an ego problem? <laughs> yes, you know? Um, so it's all, I think it's all got its basis in, in real life, yeah. yeah. I think we're gonna take some questions from people in the audience. Anybody? This young lady in the front row. Hi, um, I'm a huge fan of the show and there's one thing that I'd like to briefly brush on and that's that this show is extremely progressive, not necessarily in its content, but in the fact that it stars a colored woman. It um, has, a, you know, it has a very explicit homosexual relationship, um, mixed race relationships, it's just very, culturally progressive, which is something that I absolutely adore about the show and it's something I applaud. Um, but I was just wondering, how does is that a conscious thing that you're thinking about as you're working on the show? Is that something that you're that the whole cast is very aware of or is that just kind of in the background to like, it shouldn't even be news <laughs> type of thing? I think the spirit of what you're talking about, we are <laughs> conscious of and, and, and grateful for. You know, just the same way you are. Um, Mo and Shonda went to the same high school. Uh, what, what was it? Uh, Marion Catholic in Marian Chicago Catholic. Heights. And, Sh and Mo, and I, Mo and I were talking about it. And, and it was, a, uh, for its era, for its geography, let's say it was particularly diverse. You know, that would be a fair thing to say. I haven't, I haven't talked to Shonda about this, but I have heard her say all the way back to the beginning of Grey's Anatomy, um, 11 some years ago. Uh, I've heard her say, two, two journalists, more than once, a version of, guys, uh, uh, sexual preference, religious preference, choice, sexual choice, um, um, uh, race, background, ethnicity, these are not on the top of my consciousness list um, growing up or now, the, um, what music do you listen to? What did you read? Uh, um, do I like you? Are you funny? <laughs> you know, that, the normal things of how we uh, um, are, you know, attracted to each other. Um, she said, that's kind of like at the top of my list of, of how I choose friends and how I'm influenced by people. Um, so, uh, so, so that leads to a culture where my character is introduced as gay four episodes in by Olivia coming to the front door and a man answering the door and saying without any expositional ado, um, my husband does not work on Sundays. What are you, Olivia, what are you doing here? And immediately we know that Olivia knows James. Who is this James? Oh, James is, oh. Uh, James is uh, Cyrus's husband. Oh, Cyrus is gay. Oh, okay. Uh, and and that's how it was received by us too. My wife shrieked from another room uh, because she is the casting director of of uh, all things Shondaland from Grey's Anatomy on. And I sleep my way into parts. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, uh, <laughs> yeah. And and. Um, and she shrieks from another room, you guys. And, <laughs> and we have a pack. She can't tell me stuff that my castmates don't know. Um, it would get me in trouble with Shonda, and it'd be impractical, too, because the script's going to change seven times or whatever. But it's, it's like a little firewall, you know, <laughs> in, in pretend land. And I said, like, what are you shrieking about? You can't tell me. And now my curiosity has peaked. And, ah, man. And, and she would tell me later, well, I read the name James, and I thought, Shonda, you are so funny. You're so eccentric. So you've named a woman Jane. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then it turns out that, oh, my 
God, Cyrus is gay. Oh, Jeff's going to get a kick out of this. <laughs> He's played gay before. Yeah, it'll be fine. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think it's a beautiful, I think that's a, uh, that's kind of a beautiful culture that she is advocating for kind of quietly, you know, and just saying, it's, I feel like it's how I grew up. Anybody got a problem with this? Um, what she does enjoy simultaneously is she, I remember a an answer to a journalist question. She's saying, um, I just love that my closeted gay Republican chief of staff is pretending to threaten to out the first lady as a closeted lesbian. It's so wrong that I love it. <laughs> you know, um, so I think she, you know, she, she loves the uh, use of all of the stereotypes, you know, and all the prejudices. It's like, well, all's fair in love and war, so I'm gonna use somebody else's prejudices to get my way. Uh, um, but she doesn't seem to hold them, really. It's a much more inclusive dinner table. Yeah. Sorry, Mo, that was your job. No, you Look do at me. it. Look at me. You pick. Sorry. You pick. You pick. Who did you pick? I guess, young lady. Yes. Yeah. Do you believe in a lot of destructive Look, you get to be really loud. <laughs> Sorry. You be behave in a lot of destructive behavior towards your own personal life, um, specifically in regards to James. And I, I don't want to ruin it for everyone, but um, <laughs> after you know the end of your relationship with yes. James, you still continue to behave in the same um, behavior that got you to the place where you are now. So I was just wondering, is there anything that will deter you from... Yeah, you know, it's still early in that, it's still early in that evolution, you know, story-wise, is what I assume. We've seen kind of the early and first chapter reverberations of somebody who's uh, faced this kind of loss. And we've seen shock and some denial, and some rage, and some real grief. And we've seen glimmers of, wow, a leopard can't change his spots, you know? <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, and so I think that's all up for grabs. The answer to your question is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know any more than you do. We stopped production um, for the season a couple of weeks ago. You're about to see the final episode of the season um, this next Thursday, this coming Thursday. And um, where the professional surprisers that are the writing team take us, you know, is my, your guess is as good as mine, yeah. Uh, another yeah, lady you, in the Mo, back row? Yeah. Is there almost in the back row? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And this is really a question about your process. My husband and I have a joke because it is a very fast-paced hour of television. And I mean, the plot, everything, boom, 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 and he can't keep up with you. So he, like, he has to sort of come at little groups of it. And what I'm wondering is when you're filming, is, does it feel that intense all the time? Do you feel like you're at a much faster pace than other work you've done? Or does that not happen? Because to me, it's one of the most intense both in terms of plot and energy show I've ever seen. Shonda, I think she knew subconsciously, consciously, what she was attempting to do. When she watched with us the first three episodes before the public had seen them at her house, the writers and the directors, I remember one comment. Um, she said, I didn't know we could pack this much story into 42 minutes. I am really, I don't think she went on to the second sentence. I don't know if she was shocked, really pleased, intrigued. I got, from the tone of her voice, I got all those things, you know? I, th I think it was purposeful and I think she was kind of glad and I think she was intrigued. And another aspect of this, 
She said to us early on, and on numerous occasions, she said, you guys, we've got to go faster. Uh, you've got to talk faster. You've got to talk, whenever we slow down, um, there's just a code word, scandal speed. Um, we've got to go faster. It reminds me, you guys, I'm very old, but it reminds me of not things I lived through, but things I admired, movies from the 30s and 40s. Um, um, that were like Preston Sturgis comedies and Howard Hawks comedies and whatever. They talk a mile a bloody minute. Um, if you want to know what, if anybody's a film buff and they want to know what I'm talking about, there's a film adaptation of, a, of You Can't Take It With You, the classic <laughs> Kaufman and Hart play. And they talk 700 miles per hour. And, and um, Shonda said to us, you guys, I could, I could try to make up actor-friendly reasons as to why this must be, but I just tell you, I have to watch all the hours of footage um, to try to help us edit together something beautiful. It's horrible when it's slow, <laughs> and it's a lot better when it's fast. I sat down with Sam Skinner, who, uh, another Chicagoan, and um, George Bush Seniors, I never know how to say their two names, so George Bush Senior. Um, um, w H W B W yeah. um, H the W. The first one. The, the first one. <laughs> the father, and and uh, Sam Skinner was his final chief of staff, and was one of Judy Smith's bosses. And Judy Smith is the lawyer turned federal prosecutor turned media expert turned professional fixer upon whom this is all based. That is upon whom scandal is based, and who uh, Carrie Washington's character is based. And she's a real life woman and she's two blocks from the White House and she runs a professional fixing shop. And um, uh, Sam said to me, in answer to me saying, man, what's the duration like? What's a day like? What is the pace like? And he paused and he said, Jeff, you ever try to drink out of a fire hose? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, what a beautiful image. And then I read somewhere um, the Pew Charitable Trust created a very cool, practical, great for political science students, great for people interested in that. It's a tool sitting there on the internet that was basically built for the administrations to change so that the hundreds of people in the West and East Wing have a lot of uh, correspondence and um, interview about the nuts and bolts of jobs in the East and West Wing so they can figure out what they're doing without spending the first two years you know, um, in a disoriented fog. Anyway, I found out there that the average tenure for chiefs of staff is about a year and a quarter, a little less than a year and a quarter. That um, man or woman, no, no, we're still in a very sexist world. I don't think there have been any women chiefs of staff. I don't think. Um, um, but, but anyway, the men turn gray faster than the presidents um, in the job that I'm pretending on TV. So it's interesting. So I that's about speed. I, yeah. I'm, I think we don't have any more time. I think we have oh, to Oh, but you No, oh, come sorry. on. I'll be really fast. I won't Just talk one so long. One more. I won't more. talk so long. Okay, yay. Um, you can tell that not only you love each other as people, but I'm constantly hearing that you're just stunned by the specific acting in an episode, or um, I just hear a lot of that in interviews, and I'm wondering if, like, I didn't realize that you knew Dan Bukatinsky for 15 years, yeah. so is there anybody that you just met on one of the first days and have just been, you've been stunned by, and you can't believe you, you know, if you this get to work sound, with This sounds like a corny response, but it, it is, it's the whole village. It, I didn't know Bellamy's work. I didn't really know Carrie's Neither work. I. I knew more of Tony's work. <laughs> I didn't know Guillermo's work. I didn't know, I knew a little bit of Katie's work. Um, but, and, and this is completely biased, but my wife put them together. Yeah. Uh, she's really good. <laughs> she's really good at it. She created Friday Night Lights, the cast. She created uh, Grey's Anatomy, Private Practice. She created the film for Peter Berg, uh, Lone Survivor, you know, the cast. She's just great at it. And like I said before, I never expected to, to have this level of 
awe and gratitude for the chops surrounding me since I was 19 with Gary Sinise, John Malkovich, Laurie Metcalf, Joan Allen, et cetera, et cetera. I, it's, it's like a dream come true. Yeah. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you for this great chat. Thank you, Mo. <laughs> Thanks, you guys.